Morgan, can you hear me? Hi, Corey. Yes, you're on and we can see your video. It looks great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hello and welcome to today's City Club of Boise COVID-19 Healthcare Expert Panel Discussion. I'm Corey Serber from St. Alphonsus and I'm a member of the City Club's Forums Committee and today's moderator. This program is being delivered online, so welcome to our attendees. Please note that video or audio functions will not be available from your computers, we'll only be seeing and hearing from our panelists. I want to welcome our radio listeners who will be joining us at a later date via Boise State Public Radio on KBSX 91.5 and its affiliates throughout Southern Idaho and Northern Nevada. Today's forum is available for our audience in large part because of our City Club partners and sponsors. I would like to take time to thank a few of these organizations that help us achieve our mission to ensure compelling conversations, engage citizens, and a dynamic community. Our premier sponsor is Northwest Nazarene University and the NNU College of Business. Our annual sponsor is St. Luke's Health System. Today's program is sponsored by Ada County Medical Society, Optum Idaho, and Saltzer Health. We also receive support from our forum series sponsors, AARP Idaho, Bank of Idaho, 
Climatech Corporation, Concordia University School of Law, Echelon Group, Micron, and Pacific Source Health Plans. City Club of Boise receives grant funding from the Idaho Humanities Council. Thanks also to our media partners, which include Boise State Public Radio, 670 KBOI, Idaho Statesman, and Idaho Public Television, and our university partners, U of I, ESU, and NNU. Many thanks to those of you who support City Club of Boise with membership or a do donation made during registration for this forum. We need your help during this time of disruption. Please text the word Boise, B-O-I-S-E, to 243-725, that's 243-725, to make a donation in any amount, $5 or $50, it all helps make sure we meet our budget needs. Following our panelists' opening remarks, there, there will be an opportunity for them to respond to audience questions. You can use the Q&A function of Zoom, just type your question in, or you can email it to Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N, at cityclubofboise.org, and it will be sent directly to me. I'll do my best to get to listener questions and may group similar topics together in the essence of time. Now let's get down to business. Let me introduce our healthcare expert panelists. We have Tommy Alquist, MD, with Crush the Curve Idaho, Brandon Atkins, Preventive Health Services Program Manager and Acting Public Information Officer for Central District Health, Dr. Christine Hahn, the State Epidemiologist from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, Dr. Stephen Nemerson from St. Alphonsus, um, who is Chief Medical Officer there and also a member of Idaho, Idaho's Testing Task Force, and Dr. James Souza, uh, who is St. Luke's Health System's Chief Medical Officer and co-chairs Idaho's Testing Task Force. So thank you to all of our uh, panelists for being with us today. And instead of having you give introductory remarks out of the interest of time, we're gonna launch into our topics for today. And um, I will sort of target um, specific topics to our speakers based on their expertise. I will ask our uh, panelists to keep, please keep responses to two to three minutes max. We, out of um, interest of time and the number of topics that we'd like to cover today, uh, we'd like to move along and give everybody a chance to speak. So Dr. Hahn, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, being our state epidemiologist, could you give us the latest update on Idaho COVID trends and hotspots? Are we currently seeing a second surge in cases or are we still in the first one? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, as you all know, um, and most of our audience is well aware, you know, we had a, a, a surge at the end of March and into early April. Uh, that I'm happy to say did subside. And I think uh, largely through the participation with um, Idaho citizens and really responding to the um, many, many people, including many in our healthcare partners, uh, leading physicians, um, the governor, um, the director of the Department of Health and Welfare, who requested uh, that people start social distancing, physically distancing themselves, wearing face coverings, um, uh, a lot of businesses, of course, eventually were shut down, uh, forcing some of that, but really a lot of cooperative um, response by the public. So I do feel like we had a wave that did indeed go down quite a bit. Now, it didn't go to zero. Um, those of you that follow our uh, web page or follow the web page on your local uh, public health district page or other sites will see that we've continued to have activity in the state. So the virus has never gone away. Um, but as we've slowly tried to safely open, we have seen really in the last week or so um, some increase in cases. I know we'll get into that probably later. I'll let uh, Brandon from the Central District Health Department address maybe what he thinks is happening in Ada County. Uh, but we are concerned that we're starting to see a little trickling up 
And when we look at our neighbors, Utah and some of Oregon, um, some of those states, they're seeing real increases. So we are concerned that we're starting to see maybe uh, a second wave already. Thank you. Um, well, and with that nice tee up, I will go to Brandon next. And um, maybe you can say just a little bit about, you know, the case um, trends in Ada County, but I'd also like you to go into contact tracing a little bit. There's, we've heard it talked about in the media, heard some, you know, maybe rumors and myths about what it entails. Um, but we need to understand why contact tracing is important, how it happens, and maybe how to look out for scammers that are starting to use, you know, maybe texting people and saying that you were exposed in a certain location and please enter this personal information. So, Brandon, I'll hand it to you. All in two to three minutes, and that <laughs> is the that is the fire hydrant and go. So yes, we are seeing an upward trend here in Ada County, and a lot of that is in particular uh, orientation to some of the locations that we're seeing it. And part of that does tie into our contact tracing and how we're able to identify that. Our epidemiology teams are able to work through individuals who test positive and find out information through contact tracing about who, where, why, how, when, all of those investigative tidbits that are important for us to know what we're seeing in disease trends. And one of the things that we have noticed with the latest opening in our phasing is that we have some more of our social environments that have opened that a lot of people have felt they, they've been missing out on and they wanted to participate in. And a lot of the trending that we're seeing, particularly in our case spike right now, has been associated with that. So in our contact tracing as they go through, they're able to link individuals in a place and time. So you have investigators calling these positive cases and those cases then say to them, hey, I was out with my friends at this particular date on this particular time at this particular location and three or four or five or however many of us were all engaged in these activities, we're moving around and they are all now testing positive. Others in those environments, when we pushed messaging out to say, hey, these were potential exposure risks to others that could have been there, have since come in. And we know that through contact tracing, we're now up over 40 cases just in this one particular time frame that we're looking at with these that are linked to this specific case. And that doesn't mean that there aren't others that could be out there and that we're not going to see. We continue to see that trending up. But it, it's disconcerting to us because what that means is that those individuals, although it was a snapshot in time, they're moving out into the communities and while they may have mild to moderate illness, they're then spreading before they know that they've tested positive for it. And so as Chris alluded to, we are going to see an upward trend here in Ada County and we're fearful that people not adhering to some of the, the contact tracing uh, etiquette that is being reinforced when people are being called. They're saying, hey, please let others know that they may have been exposed. Let us know who we can contact so we can reach out to them. But people have to continue to do their part. We can't be hand-holding for this process. And we do require people to help and participate. But not everybody is a contact tracer. You shouldn't just do a respond to a, a, a voicemail message that says, hey, I'm so-and-so. If you don't get someone that's calling and saying, this is, this is someone with Central District Health reaching out to you regarding uh, some information that I need to contact you about a recent exposure risk, please call me at, at this number at Central District Health. I would be, uh, I would pause. And, and again, that's for us here in Central District Health. Any of the local public health jurisdictions would have that same response, however, and be identifying them, whether it's Southwest Health or South Central. Someone from their agency will identify themselves appropriately and would never ask for that information over the phone. You should never be saying, hey, this is my name, this is my date of birth. Any of that personal health information should never be shared over a text message or an email message. You should be able to talk to someone specifically. And they, they do all that they can to reach out to them and get that information conducted in a, a safe, uh, secure manner. Great, thank you, Brandon, and see you did it. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. All right, next we'll move to Dr. Nemerson. Um, what should Idahoans know about hospital readiness, response, and recovery efforts, and what are the greatest challenges that Idaho hospitals face right now? Oh, Corey. I, I think I'm going to start with the second part of the question is um, what should they know about hospital readiness and what's the greatest challenge that we're facing right at this moment? And it is um, for the past few months, we have really ramped down our ability to take care of uh, elective procedures and um, patients' chronic care needs. So that pent up need 
um, we need to address now, and we need to address it as quickly as possible. And uh, I can share a number of stories um, about patients who come to our emergency departments with um, chronic conditions like diabetes, congestive heart failure, where um, that management was not tended to during this uh, most recent wave of COVID responsiveness, um, and they've come in severely compromised, and we've really had to engage in aggressive emergency care that might otherwise not have been needed. So that's the greatest challenge that we have right at the moment. Um, th then in terms of readiness versus what we call here um, attending to medically necessary time-sensitive care, um, it's a balance. And Maintaining um, readiness at all times is paramount. So all of the healthcare systems, including my own in the state of Idaho, are um, expected to maintain a certain degree of capacity in the event that there's a sudden exponential surge in COVID. Um, we would expect that that would come through our emergency departments and through private doctor's offices. And so we have um, effective communication in place. We have um, capacity standing by at all times, and then we have surge plans at the ready to be able to expand beyond that. Simultaneous with that, as I was explaining about that medically necessary care um, for pent-up demand, um, big picture, we are at uh, or very close to our normal functioning for providing that care now, um, and we still have a backlog in, in terms of months uh, of appointments and procedures that need to be tended to. Um, we will, uh, and in fact we do on a daily basis, assess what that need is versus what COVID incidence is and what our predictions are about the short-term future to be able to balance all of that. Um, and then finally, we have the ability at the turn of a switch to be able to expand capacity uh, a significant percentage beyond our license bed capacity if necessary. And then we obviously have surge plans uh, that go beyond that. I think the last thing to mention is that th this is a very structured process. St. Alphonsus stood up its incident command a good month or two before the pandemic hit the shores of the United States. And we did that knowing that it was likely to come here. Our incident command structure is consistent with FEMA's uh, national um, response program structure that's recommended. And we are maintaining that incident command despite the fact that the incidence of COVID is very low currently um, in prep for what may come our way. I'm going to shift now to Dr. Souza. Um, as co-chair of the governor's testing task force, can you sort of give us the schoolhouse rock version of the different types of testing um, that there is? There's the um, PCR testing with the throat swab, and then there's the antibody testing. Can you help us understand what the roles of each of those tests are and what the limitations are? Sure, let me take a crack at that. Um, so all the testing that, that is done is done under an FDA emergency use authorization. Um, I think there's more than 100 tests that have that, that EUA status at this point. Um, there are uh, two main types of tests. Uh, the first type is a, what we call a molecular test. And the second type would be a serologic or antibody test. Um, within the molecular test, uh, category. These are the things you see people collecting with swabs uh, and whatnot. Um, the 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 one that's most prevalent, the one that we're that's being used, is a PCR test. Uh, that stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's a test for the um, RNA code inside the virus. Um, the other uh, uh, molecular test that I'm not aware if we have any, we've seen any of that in our community yet, or even if it's widely available as an uh, antigen test. This test for protein on the surface of the virus. Um, for the listeners, this would be kind of equivalent to the rapid flu test. And, you know, I think similar to the rapid flu test, 
we'll expect a, a greater rate of false negatives. So when we are seeing patients during flu season, we'll apply a rapid flu test to a highly symptomatic, you know, highly probable case. And if it comes back positive, that's helpful. If it comes back negative, it's not helpful, and we end up doing a, a different test. So those, those are the two tests that are available um, in the molecular uh, realm. You know, the molecular tests are largely um, for diagnosing active disease. Um, early on, uh, those tests were being applied exclusively to symptomatic uh, people. Um, increasingly, there's demand for testing of asymptomatic people, usually um, anticipating some sort of an output from the test results. So, for example, inside of our healthcare systems, prior to an aerosol generating procedure like a breathing tube being placed, we're doing asymptomatic testing. Certain states have started to say you can't come to our state without an ace, uh, without a negative test within a certain period of time. Um, so yes, the schoolhouse rock version. There's, there's lots more to say about that, but the antibody test um, tests for the human body's reaction to the uh, infection, and um, uh, different antibody tests can test for IgM. That's the first antibody made. IgG. That's the the antibody that comes later, like a few weeks later, and might offer protection, but but we don't know that. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like uh, the rearview mirror test. It, it tells you about something that happened in the uh, recent or or even distant past, and that this person was infected with SARS-CoV-2, the agent of COVID-19. Can I add to Dr. Nemerson's comment from a healthcare delivery system? Our, our, the challenge I am the most concerned about, I agree with everything he said, um, and you know, uh, we're all preparing for surges, but to the degree that we get inundated with COVID-19 patients, that pent up demand uh, for you know, our chronically ill patients is gonna create a public health disaster that, that might make COVID-19 look small. So it's very important that we not allow that to occur. And, and the biggest challenge I'm seeing is some of the goofy ideas about not wearing a mask. I mean, there's recent data in the last couple of weeks from the World Health Organization. It's not high quality data. It's the best we have, you know, regarding where they, they did a meta-analysis. And I think they showed an 83% reduction in transmission when you wear a mask. There was a recent unintentional experiment the listeners may have heard about, uh, uh, two hairdressers in Missouri um, who tested positive for COVID-19 with symptoms, decided to open their salon. Four weeks ago in the press, that, that was like called out as highly irresponsible, I agree. Well, the unintentional experiment is that with 150 plus exposures, because they wore masks consistently, change the physical layout to protect customers from other customers, hand hygiene, surfaces, zero conversions. That's some really interesting information. And I wish that we would, um, in the middle of a pandemic, talk about masks like scientists and not politicians. That's what I'm worried about. Thank you. And we're gonna circle back to uh, masks uh, in a little bit. Um, I'll turn now to um, Dr. Alquist. Um, Tommy, what has been the focus of Crush the Curve Idaho in the testing arena? And has your focus changed at all as we continue to learn more about this new virus as time goes on? Yeah, thanks, Corey. And it's, it's good to be here today with everyone. So we, we started our effort at 9.47 p.m. on April 2nd when we said there's a whole bunch of people that are really worried about how we help this and uh, put together a group of CEOs. It, it boiled down to a working group of six of us. So I wanna make sure I say that. There's six of us that meet daily and, and uh, uh, the companies and individually we've put a lot of money into this to try to just be helpful to other businesses. Our initial purpose was just to try to figure out capacity for the, for the PCR testing. Uh, as you know, no one had the kits and that was paralyzing everyone. And if we would have had testing back then, we would have tested and isolated people, but we couldn't test people. 
And so that was the first thing we did. I'm, I'm happy to report we can now test 16,000 people a day with Crush the Curve Idaho. Um, we're not testing anywhere near that um, because there's still a lot of confusion on who needs tests. Asymptomatic people, who's going to get them, who's going to pay for it. The, the confusion has never been at a, at a, I mean, it's just the confusion never ends of who's, who's doing what and what lane we should be in. But we have plenty of capacity to test people for PCR. The other thing we did early on is we thought it was very important for us to know what was the prevalence of, of, of COVID in on communities around the state. So we were able to test, I don't know the number now, but it's well over 12,000 people for the antibodies just to say, okay, what is the prevalence? How many people had it here? And I just saw last night that some data is coming out of Blaine County where they're at 35%. Well, we're at 1.7% here. So that let us know that it's very, very, very low. So anyone that gets that data should know that we should be protecting ourselves like Dr. Souza said. Um, and then I think the last thing that we're doing is we're helping with messaging. So um, I think in the last week, uh, President Trump said we should just stop testing people and the virus would go away. And then uh, Vice President Pence in the Wall Street Journal yesterday said it's over. Uh, we don't have to worry about another, another curve coming. And I just think it's just garbage. I think the, I think the communication uh, in our country, in our state, amongst ourselves could not be worse. I worry about people. I'm frustrated. Um, I'll give you a little analogy in two minutes, I promise. In, in, in 2001, uh, Marshall Priest and I started chest pain centers around Idaho. And as much as you wanted to tell people about heart disease, don't smoke, don't eat cheeseburgers, exercise, we knew people weren't going to do that. And so we set up chest pain centers around Idaho with protocols say, if you get a heart attack, here's how we're going to get you from an EMS uh, rig into a cath lab as soon as possible. Time is muscle. I think we spend an inordinate amount of time as a state, as a country, as a community, as anyone talking about how we're going to prevent this with people complying. And we need to spend a lot more time talking about what is our capacity for testing and how are we going to get people tested quickly and isolate this. Um, every day, we have over 600 companies that have signed up with us to help them. We get calls every day of saying, hey, where do I go? I've got asymptomatic people in Jerome. I've got asymptomatic people in Meridian. I can't get testing for them. I want to know if they have it so we can keep them home. I'm worried that as this thing comes up, and it's a lot earlier than I thought it would be. I thought we had a little window here till fall. I really did. I thought this was the honeymoon period. And I thought, hey, until fall, we can just get our stuff together. And now, you know, we're already seeing upticks. It's time for people to wear a mask and take this serious. And it's time for us to have clarity on what happens when you have an outbreak. Because there's companies right now hiring PR firms because they don't want anyone to know they have an outbreak and they don't want to test because it's too expensive. And we got to change that and try to encourage testing and isolation to stay open for business. Some concept of an accordion opening and closing a business, I have, I've never heard of a worse idea. We are not going to be able to shut this sucker down this fall and we better get our stuff together before then. So there's, there's my brief intro. I'll take a moment just to remind our, la our radio listeners that you're listening to a City Club of Boise virtual conversation featuring Dr. Tommy Alquist, Brandon Atkins, Dr. Christine Hahn, Dr. Stephen Nemerson, and Dr. James Souza. The next question I'll go um, back to Dr. Hahn and to have you comment on whether the recent increases that we are seeing in case numbers in Idaho are just a result of increased testing volumes or are we truly seeing an acceleration of spread? Thanks, uh, Corey, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, so basically we think it's a combination of both. We have seen increase in testing. Um, you may have seen uh, a couple weeks ago, we topped 10,000 tests in that week, which as, as Dr. Alquist, I'm sure would agree, it's not enough. We, we have a long way to go and we do need to keep making strides in testing, but we are seeing an increase in testing. And um, you'll notice uh, despite, despite that increase in testing, our percent positivity has stayed about the same, um, but, the absolute increase in cases, and Brandon talked about this a little bit, certainly is real. I think there's both uh, that's going on for sure. Um, uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about that a little bit more, but what we're seeing is mostly young folks. They are going out to the bars, they're going out and having a good time, and uh, you know they're not at risk personally or they don't perceive themselves at risk of severe disease, 
Um, but certainly they can, uh, we're worried um, that uh, young folks are, are potentially going to see this into the rest of the population. Um, you know, they all have family members, they all have co-workers, they all have people that they uh, could spread this to. So we are very worried about that there is a real increase going on um, and are working really hard um, to, to respond to a couple comments made earlier. We absolutely agree. The communication right now, uh, we are working on a more visible, you know, we've been working through our media channels, working through um, uh, blogs and social media, but I think we need, um, we need to go bigger. We need to have billboards and bus wraps and all that and just reminding people, and I absolutely agree, face coverings. We use the word mask loosely, but really for the most public right now, it's those face coverings, which are cloth. They can be homemade. They, it could be a bandana. Would like to see something a little more protective than that. But really, uh, we need to encourage people. I go out every time I'm in a store, I have mine on or a, a public place like that. And I do notice, depending on where you go, uh, some places are really good. The businesses are great about, um, they make their employees wear a face covering and they encourage um shoppers or, or visitors to do so other places you feel like you're the only one and um uh, so i do worry that we aren't getting that message out as well as we need to and we need to do more um next we'll we'll circle back to brandon um to comment about you know the the scenario of the the group of people who visited downtown bars uh the first weekend that they were reopened and, and then tested positive. Um, can you maybe run us through what, what that contact tracing process looked like? And does that trigger um, any kind of food or uh, restaurant sort of facility inspection by Central District Health? Sure. So again, we know that this started initially right the 5th and 6th. We saw a trickle in of cases that started out being five confirmed cases and five probable cases. That has ballooned. Uh, you've seen that in the media. You've seen the, from the press releases that we've given that we're up over 40 cases associated with that same, out, that same incident uh, with individuals looking at how it has uh, through the messaging, hey, if you were there, if you were experiencing it, you went to any of these locations and people are identifying that. So those people become linked to that particular incident. And the number of probable cases actually went down because a couple of those cases actually tested and received a confirmed confirmation that they did currently have an active infection. So, so we're seeing that and we're not done with that. And we've seen others that have grown into that. So part of that contact tracing, again, is reaching out and making sure that we're getting accurate information from individuals, but also addressing all those that could be potentially at risk. Because as Chris pointed out, these aren't just people who live on their own. They may be 20 something, 30 something, whatever, that are attending these very, very communal social environments, but they're around a lot of other people. They're going home and we're seeing that there are individuals within home settings that are, that are seeing cases within those homes now. And this is what we anticipate will be a real detriment to our population, and particularly in Ada County, where you have this high volume population and people are wanting to get out. They wanna go eat out at the restaurants. They wanna be participating. But if we have more and more people that are actively being exposed, we're going to see that increase. And yes, increased testing is certainly something we want to see more and more of. We still need to have people doing all that they can to take to heart what the recommendations are. And we're just not seeing that. We're seeing a lot of people who have chosen to look the other way and figure, hey, they'll let us know if something changes. And what I can tell you is that it will be left to the local public health jurisdictions to say what's impacting us, because it's not going to be the same. If I'm in Declo, Idaho, on the other side of the state where they've seen almost nothing happening, it seems a little bit punitive to say everything's shut down because Ada County is burgeoning with all these new cases. But we certainly at the local level need to be able to say St. Al's and St. Luke's are not going to be able to see hundreds of new cases each day and impact all of their populations if our population here isn't willing to take a, additional precautions. And that may mean that we have to move some of those openings or some of those restrictions back. We absolutely are working with owners of businesses. If they ever have questions, of course, they're working with our environmental health team that go out and inspect regularly a lot of the food of established, the food establishments, excuse me, 
but any business can reach out and ask for guidance. Uh, we certainly are providing that guidance on a regular level. We are, we are speaking with you know, a joint information system group. We also are operating under an incident command structure where we are communicating messaging to all community partners and trying to get resources available for people so that they know, hey, there is a way that you can be safer and you can be doing more in your own business. But again, it's really left to the individual level. Even if you have social distancing being practiced in a bar, how do you effectively uh, have your patrons that are following those, those guidances unless that, that particular temptation is removed, right? I mean, I, I, there's no other way to put it. You've got a group of 10 friends that decide they're going to go out and hang out together and bar hop together and not wear masks. And this is all hypothetical, but if that were to happen, those people aren't doing all they can to protect themselves or others, and that's an unfortunate risk that's going to impact us. Thank you. Um, next, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Nemerson and Dr. Souza to comment on uh, the types of healthcare innovations that have come out of the rapid response necessary to this pandemic. Um, and for you to comment on what innovations we've seen that, that might stick with us going forward. Sorry, I can start. Um, it's been quite an exciting journey, hasn't it, the past couple of months. We started with our president taking an anti-malarial drug called hydroxychloroquine, and now we're at a point where um, it's actually not um, being dispensed for the purpose of trying to prevent or treat COVID, because uh, science has proven uh, almost conclusively that it's completely ineffective and it carries the risk of causing fatal heart dysrhythmias. Um, in terms of other innovations, there are a multitude of drug studies going on throughout the country and we participate here at St. Alphonsus in many of those, um, looking at drugs that are given as part of the routine care, the treatment of the symptoms that patients that have COVID um, require treatment for to see if there's any benefit versus patients that don't have COVID that receive the same medications um, in terms of outcome for those COVID specific patients. Um, so that is one type of innovative therapy that's being looked at continuously. Um, and in the media, there have been all kinds of medications then that pop up periodically as having a suggestion they may, may be of benefit. Nothing's been proven to be conclusive except for uh, the medication called remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug. Um, it came out of uh, use in Ebola infections, and I won't go into great detail about that, but it seems to suggest that patients who are critically ill with COVID who receive this medication under very specific circumstances, so not even in the circumstance where someone's critically ill from COVID, they may not benefit, but using defined criteria, they may have a better outcome, and we have that access to that medication in Idaho, and here at St. Alphonsus, we've treated two patients with that medicine um, with benefit. Uh, other innovative therapies then generally um, are support types of therapies. We have something called helmet ventilation that we're making available here, um, which is a way to provide respiratory support in a different approach um, because patients that have COVID that require ventilatory support, um, they can't be treated the way that most patients um, who receive ventilatory support um, are. Uh, so those are just a couple. And then uh, convalescent plasma, um, as of last week, was still seeming to show promise. And then some recent reports this week suggest that it may not be as effective as we'd hoped. Um, so that's among the categories of therapies that are being moved forward. I, I want to tag on to some comments made earlier by other panelists to say though that the most important thing is preventative therapy, um, i.e. wear masks, wash your hands, keep away from others, um, because if you don't get COVID, then you're not gonna need any of this stuff. Um, and we need to continue to reemphasize that. And the last thing is in terms of um, capacity, I appreciate the comment, we don't want St. Al's or St. Luke's to get overwhelmed, but rest assured that um, if, if we do um, it, unfortunately experience patients who are sick, we are not gonna be withholding therapies. Um, we're gonna be delivering state-of-the-art care 
um, based on known scientific criteria um, to best outcome. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Corey, and I appreciate Steve's comments. Um, since he was talking about therapies, maybe I'll talk about care delivery innovations that are being implemented. Um, and maybe for the listeners, I, I just asked them to think about the spectrum of care from the ambulatory to the inpatient to the uh, back to home and, and post acute. Um, we've been deploying uh, telehealth solutions um, aggressively in all three of those areas. So in, in the ambulatory, we went live with video visits in mid April, are, are now past 30,000 of those. Um, uh, roughly 15% of our um, clinic visits are now happening with two-way audiovisual, and w we'd like to see that accelerate. Uh, you know, in our rural state, making people drive to a clinic appointment, especially in inclement weather or dangerous roads and stuff, it just doesn't make sense. And we're finding that the resistance that was previously there from physicians disappeared, and the resistance that might have been there from patients has disappeared. Uh, in my own clinic, uh, the first time I, I, I used uh, uh, telehealth, I had uh, uh, two patients who were brave enough to ask me. Probably everybody was thinking, that, hey, doc, can we do it this way next time? Um, in the acute care setting, uh, we've uh, expanded the use of our tele-ICU. So we've got sites that don't have boots on the ground, intensive care provider staffing. And we have successfully managed critically ill ARDS patients in even prone position, um, uh, high-end therapies, um, utilizing virtual intensivists supporting a hospitalist anesthesia uh, approach at the bedside. We've also stood up a virtual hospital in our, uh, one of our facilities in the inpatient unit so that um, COVID positive patients we can assist the bedside nurses, don't have to don and doff quite so often and manage a lot of the um, uh, questions that are just quick one-offs um, uh, through the nurse in the virtual care center. And we'll be able to deploy that across multiple sites. And then in that post-acute setting, as people go home, we've been trying to, again, uh, as, as Dr. Nemerson talked about, preparing for capacity and needing to surge and being thoughtful about what we want to therefore move the people who are getting better out more quickly. We've started a remote patient monitoring program for um, patients where we're discharging them a day or two early on oxygen and then monitoring them. Uh, it, it's almost, um, it's, a, it's a version of hospital at home light. Um, so those are some of the care delivery innovations we've been trying to advance. COVID's created the opportunity. Maria, I just want to add one other thing, which is really important for the audience to know, and that is we are all in communication with, with each other regularly. So as there's a potential new innovative therapy or there's a new approach to care or we're talking about um, maintaining the um, movement of patients through the entire care process, uh, if one of us has a best practice, we share it with the others. And um, we also debate it with with each other because there are certain things like that hydroxychloroquine where um, information starts to come out that maybe it isn't as good as we thought it was. Uh, and then we try and figure out what we, what we think is in the best interest of the entire community. Great, thank you, Dr. Nemerson. So um, the next question I'll, I'll direct to Tommy. Um, there, there has been a lot of pushback against safety measures from Republican politicians, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, several legislators, um, and the President won't wear a mask to show responsible actions should other notable Republicans, um, including the Governor, including you, um, including our Congressmen and Senators at the federal level, have public service messages asking people to wear masks, social distance, and avoid high density functions, and furthermore, should masks perhaps be required uh, given the evidence that exists supporting how effective they are? Well, there's leading the witness and then there's that question. Sorry. <laughs> it didn't come from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so of course, I mean, it's super disappointing, right? I mean, the, 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 we're in an election year and shame on both sides. It's just it's just crazy, and and it depends on the week, right? It depends on what the political gain is. I'm 
I'm convinced there's an entire team behind everyone, like telling them what to say this week based on what gets more votes, which, you know, having gone through the experience I went in a Republican primary, I mean, it taught me more in 18 months than, than the rest of my life about politics and it's messy and it's ugly. And in order to go through those primaries, people do crazy things. And I, it, I think it explains really bad behavior. So yes, I wish they set better examples. Um, they're worried about getting reelected and they're worried about their base and they're worried about the current, the current uh, political winds that are blowing. And in what we have is a public health crisis. I mean, for crying out loud, all we're asking someone to do is wear a mask to try to protect an old person, right? I mean, if that, if that to me is taking away liberty, this country's, you know, we've, we've gone to depths that I never thought we'd go. We're protecting old people with wearing, and those with their immunocompromised with a mask. Come on, that's it. I will tell you though, uh, last weekend I was in McCall and had to go three hardware stores. And here you have McCall, who is another tourist town, right? So think of what happened in Blaine County right here in Idaho. And I had to go three separate hardware stores to get something and had old guys looking at me like I was like shaking their head, rolling their eyes, like, what's this guy doing with the mask on? And I was the only guy in hardware stores with old guys that are in a tourist town. So some of this, again, I, I love talking about masks. I love it. I wish we talked more about, because I just heard, I do, heard, heard Dr. Demerson talk about all this great collaboration on treatment. If I asked this panel today, what is the joint capacity of our hospital systems and crush the curve to test people, we would not have consensus. Guarantee you we wouldn't. Actual consensus. What we would hear is, well, we can do 1,600, but we only have reagents for like 400. And we can do, we ought to all know what the testing capacity is statewide, and we ought to be prepared on the treatment side like we're collaborating on the other side. I think that the, the task force did a great job on, on telling people what to do, but it's time to say how to do it. Here's the lane, here's where you go to get tested. Don't be ashamed if you have someone pop up in your branch, right? We've had a couple of branches in the Treasure Valley that have had positives and they're like, we don't want anyone to know. No, it's the opposite. You want people to know. You wanna go get tested and you can get people tested for asymptomatics. The insurance companies still aren't paying for this either. So people that, that are working poor, that are trying to figure out life, and, and I agree, Dr. Hahn, that wrapping buses and public service amounts are great, but what about the Hispanic populations that are really where this is going on in, in, in all the meatpacking plants and in Jerome and Weezer, all these places that are driving up, that's where it's happening. It's happening in places that, that all the bus wrap in the world aren't gonna make a difference. So we really need to get messaging out there to the people that matter the most uh, one, one last comment. Priority groups was great. I listened to it. It sounded awesome. And then we had the, our phone ring off saying, hey, now I got to test my people every two weeks. They're asymptomatic priority one or two workers. Where do they go get tested? I, I don't know. Who's going to pay for it? I don't know. It is time we move to the next step on this and say, okay, here's how we're going to do this. Still focusing on, but so we want to politicize everything. And I don't want to take my time today and further politicize a mask because we all know it's crazy. It's bat crap crazy that politicians aren't wearing masks or encouraging masks. And I don't know how you can say that. But even with that, Corey, people aren't gonna wear masks. So let's keep doing our best to try to get them to wear masks, that's great. But let's prepare for the, what's the worst is gonna happen, which is your hospitals are getting overwhelmed with people that have been really dumb. Think about all the people I took care of that didn't wear helmets on motorcycles. Guess what, you still take care of them. Think of all the people that go out and get drunk and fall off buildings, you still take care of them. Same thing's gonna happen with people that don't wear masks. They're gonna make people sick and we're gonna still take care of them. So we got to pay attention to both sides of this, but yes, the politicians are making this exponentially worse. Thank you, Tommy. Um, on that note, I would like to remind our radio listeners that you're listening to a City Club of Boise virtual conversation featuring Dr. Tommy Alquist, Brandon Atkins, Dr. Christine Hahn, Dr. Stephen Nemerson, and Dr. James Souza. Um, next, I will um, go to Dr. Nemerson, and um, let's say you were placed in charge of, of um, putting forth recommendations for personal safety and responsibility in planning for large outdoor events like tree fort or recreation like at Roaring Springs. Um, what might you recommend for uh, reopening events like that? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I, I don't want my answer to be taken as any sort of guidance towards a specific event. So let me just be clear about that. Um, we actually anticipated this 
about a month ago, and we've got a working group here at St. Alphonsus um, to determine recommendations for both hosting events in or around our facilities, because we see ourselves very much as a community asset and um, a home for uh, community organizations. And also um, in what recommendations will we give to our own colleagues who are our employees um, in participating in these events outside of St. Alphonsus um, events. And, and we want to know what to sponsor and we, we want to be partners. So in terms of um, basic recommendations, you've heard all that. So I don't need to um, comment on appropriate hygiene, but the real um, thing that's a challenge is the concept of true social distance, and we use this figure of six feet, but let's be honest, 100 feet's better than six feet, right? If somebody's got COVID, the further away you can be from them, the better, and the fresher air you can breathe, the better. Um, but six feet social distance, uh, great concept. Does that mean somebody's not gonna come into your space? And does it also mean you're not gonna work, walk through a cloud of COVID that somebody's just coughed um, as you're going from point A to point B? That's the problem. Um, we can't control uh, human behavior and we don't know what's occurred just the second before we arrived on scene. Um, so for public events of this sort, particularly sports events, we're fortunate that event um, organizations like the PGA have very clear guidelines about what they uh, recommend in terms of the participants in the event and also um, the audience for the event and how to space them out in a stadium or in another setting and how to police that. And if I'm and I am a member of this community and have to make a determination, am I going to participate? Um, the first thing is, are the guidelines of that organization consistent with what the governor has um, mandated in, in this state? Second, are they consistent with CDC guidelines? And I know it's a pain to get on the web, but there are plenty of um, well-written guidelines on the CDC website that you can look at quickly and uh, compare to how the event is publicizing what they're gonna do about COVID. And then the last thing is um, in terms of the policing aspect, usually that's not going to be put on the promotional material from the event, but pick up the phone and call the host and say, I have a concern. Um, I want to know if it's going to be safe for me to come or, I, or even more importantly, I want to know if I'm going to be one of the participants in the event, I'm going to be involved in that sports activity, are you going to protect me and how are you going to do it? Uh, and if they can't give you a good answer, then I think your answer is pretty clear find something else to do. Um, last thing I, I, I wanna tag on to a comment that was made earlier, which is, yeah, we, we are all gonna be here to take care of you, um, whether you uh, are really vigilant or not so vigilant. Um, but make no mistake, this isn't about uh, giving COVID to an old person. We've seen people die in the state of Idaho who are very healthy middle-aged individuals um, for no good reason other than they caught the virus and they weren't lucky. Um, their body, for some reason, couldn't tolerate it. So it's about protecting yourself. All right, thank you. Um, speaking of large public events, it's, it's been widely publicized that the president uh, plans to, on Saturday, hold a, a large campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, packing about 20,000 people into the main arena and, uh, and up to 40,000 people in a convention center nearby. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, if you are a public health official in Tulsa, Oklahoma, what is your uh, threat assessment of, of that, in, that event's impact on COVID cases in Oklahoma. And you can, by show of hands, from one to 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Corey, Cor Cor however, <laughs> however, I will say this, I will say this, and I attended the vigil down, down at the Capitol for Black Lives Matter. It's really hard to see this politicized as hard as it is because there was not the outcry during those just packed houses. So we just gotta be careful. Both of them were really, really bad for the virus. I'm not, I mean, I went to it, I wore my mask, I tried to social distance, but, but um, 
any gathering, any gathering where you're around people that closely right now is a 10. Uh, the 10 for, for Tulsa is no different than the 10 that happened in Seattle right now. They're all 10s and we're all gonna pay the price. Yes, and in, in, in follow up to that in, you know, in relation to the protests that we have seen over the past few weeks, um, when might we expect to see, you know, what, what effect there has been um, from COVID exposure during those protests? You know, I could take this because it does and has been asked to us specifically, and I, we, we expect anywhere within the 14-day incubation period that we would start seeing that. And of course, when we're addressing this in contact tracing, we ask for specific locations. And I can tell you to this point, no one has identified as saying, hey, I have had signs and symptoms and I attended this rally and this is what was happening and this is where we are. If we were to see that kind of information being shared with us, we certainly would make that uh, a heightened awareness alert for our population because again there was a large portion as Tommy pointed out of people that did attend that uh, again behaviors on individual accounts what you're able to do and what you're able to to protect yourself and protect others with the behaviors that you're following that's the messaging that we can continue to reiterate it doesn't change the fact that packing thousands of people into a common space is going to increase your risk exponentially thank you Brandon um, so going going with this theme um how ha we've had these major events of the pandemic and then the un unrest in in this country and around the world based on um racial inequities um how do these two major events tie together in terms of um covid shining a light on inequities that exist in in our um, nation, that sort of thing. What comment might anybody have about that? Well, this is Chris. I can start um, as as uh, Dr. Alsquist already mentioned, our Hispanic population in Idaho is disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and uh, we have fortunately not seen a disproportionate number of deaths in that population, but certainly a disproportionate number of cases. And a large part of that is due to their working conditions, often uh, working in uh, large facilities, uh, meat packing facilities, that type of thing, where they're very closely to get, you know, working together. Um, and uh, we are very aware how these two um, events intersect. Um, and are working really hard to, uh, when I mentioned the billboards and the bus wraps, yes, absolutely, we will do those in Spanish and we're trying to get everything out that we can in Spanish. We've also reached out and are working with our refugee population in several ways. We've done town halls with our refugee population. We are very cognizant that people who speak different languages um, might be at higher risk. So um, absolutely these two things, that, which at first appeared unrelated, you know, to look back, it's hard to remember, but in the beginning, this was almost the opposite. We had Blaine County, kind of a more privileged set, uh, initially affected, uh, people traveling in for weddings and uh, ski events and uh, tournaments. Uh, and, and the same thing happened in Europe, you know, some of the first outbreaks were at ski resorts, uh, but it has quickly found its home, if you will, in the disadvantaged. Corey, I'll, let me just add one more quick thing to this. I, I think it's more than that. I think if you look at the PPP program, it was a joke for, for the working poor. It really, you know, the way those rounds went and who was actually available and how it, how it funded the working poor, it didn't work, right? And if you look at the way we are even treating or testing people, we're testing and treating people largely based on economic status right now. We really are. Um, we, that, that's, that's hard truth, but, but it's, it's truth. That's what we're doing. Uh, we're testing football players or we're testing skiers, ski teams, uh, you know, or basketball teams more than we're testing these working poor. I think it highlights injustices. And I think that they do blend together because I think on the racial side and on, on just the working poor poverty side, we're seeing how the country leaves people behind, especially when things are rough or in a crisis. Corey, I, I want to add something too. Um, so we talked about um, disadvantaged populations being more vulnerable, um, talked about the things that Tommy just mentioned. And then the other thing is access to medical care. So what's going on now is if you're poor and if you're unemployed, which affects disproportionately minority populations, you can't get access to medical care because you can't afford it. Um, and 
uh, if you look at the population stats around who's lost their jobs or been furloughed as a result of COVID, again, it affects the minority populations disproportionately. And so we're seeing a combination of things. One, uh, if they require medical care now, but it's not emergent, then they delay it or they don't um, receive it. And so they're coming in an extremist. Uh, and that's a tragedy. And then the other thing is, um, if they even are in extreme circumstance and they come in and get care, then they're facing bills that are um, completely unaffordable and devastating to their families. Uh, so it's one of the challenges that we have as a health system is how to meet that increased need, which we've already um, recognized and we are seeing in terms of charity care and uh, other kinds of community resources to mobilize for those individuals. But it's a struggle and, um, and it's unfortunate. Along those lines, what, um, what sort of efforts do the health systems and um, other health care providers um, need to be making to ensure that uh, people who come, come through those health care systems affected by COVID and go out to the community and are affected economically and have insecure housing, insecure access to food, um, what, what is the responsibility of the healthcare providers to make sure that their social needs are met so that their health doesn't then decline? I would say first, we, we have to all be ready and willing to jump in with both feet into the social determinants of health game. Uh, now, you know, um, that means you need to align your business model with that goal. Um, you know, uh, our, our healthcare systems uh, right now are not, right, they're not, we're not funded to provide housing, to provide food at scale, to manage uh, violence in the home at scale and drug abuse at scale. But we can, so, it, Looking to the long game, there there are ways that we can all align our business models to reward us for that work. That's that's the first thing. But in the short term, we can speak up. Um, we can serve as conveners to convene those resources in our communities in order to uh, deliver those those services and. You know, on that topic of, of speaking up, I just can't think of anybody more um, adept than those of us who lead in healthcare at, at speaking to the um, injustices uh, with that, that we see based on poverty and race. Um, because those of us who work in healthcare, we, we learned at a very tender age that rich, poor, male, female, black, white, heavy, thin, pick the color, pick the, the race, the religion, you name it, whatever your identity, that, um, sorry for that noise in my background. We all, we all hurt the same, we suffer the same, we bleed the same, we all go to the same place. Those of us in healthcare can speak to that truth and serve as that convener. I don't know if Dr. Nemerson would, would add to that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really well, well stated um, and with passion, which is what we're all about. Um, one of the blessings of being a faith-based ministry is that we're connected with an integrated care delivery network across the country that's made community health and well-being um, a foundation of what we do every day, uh, not that it's altogether different than any other um, healthcare system in this state. And, and the fact is, it's innovative community partnerships with us that we depend on to be and ensure that we can serve patients before they come into our facilities and before they reach our doctors. And then um, when their acute care needs are met, um, that they continue to get the support that they need. And food and nutrition is essential, housing is essential, um, but it, there was an old saying, it takes a village or you need to be surrounded by a team. Uh, and we really believe passionately in, about that. Um, and 
as the burden increases on our healthcare systems, which it is, um, everybody knows that um, hospitals and healthcare systems right, right now are losing money on the care of both COVID and non-COVID patients. Um, so our resources to support are dwindling, um, but the need is increasing. How do we then handle the whole situation? And we do that by having, uh, we have a consortium of post-acute care facilities, we have a network of community resources, um, and we have other teams that we um, work with on a daily and weekly basis to make sure that um, we've got good communication and um, that we can mobilize what we need for our patients. Great, thank you. Um, so we have um, a two-part question from one of our listeners today. Um, the first part is, how often should my employees be tested? That is not outlined in the testing task force recommendations. And then secondly, um, our insurance company will not cover this testing. Uh, will the state pay for it or who pays for it? And there's the, the big pause in everyone, <laughs> everyone's dis delivery mechanism, because again, those are, those are questions everybody's asking, as Tommy pointed out. And it, it's an unfortunate challenge, again, that we're dealing with and still talking to socioeconomical diversity. We look at a population that doesn't even understand what that testing looks like because it's not being translated into their language. And we don't have someone that's part of that population that's part of the conversations of how can we, how can we best address that? We're working at the local public health level to try and get in a liaison that will allow us to navigate some of our refugee populations because we know printed materials are not going to be effective. Most of them can't read their, their, their own language. They speak a language, they communicate in that language, but they need someone with that voice that can help spread that message and share that message. But all of us that speak the same language don't know how to get these, these things taken care of to that degree. So it's a big challenge. Or though it's not rocket science, here's what it is. It's, we know what our testing capacity is. We should in the Valley. We know which lane everyone's in and who's who they should be testing. We have rules with insurance companies through the state the insurance commission saying, hey, this is what, who we think you ought to cover. So for example, if you have a hot branch at a credit union with a bunch of people that were there, who's gonna test the asymptomatic people and pay for it? I would argue that should be the insurance company. Who's gonna test, you know, you know, refugee families in Twin Falls, that's probably not, that's gonna be the state. But we need to come up with a plan, not just, hey, this is how often you should test, because they've told, you look at those prior, you, you told people how often they should test, but we didn't say how you're gonna test. And so I think we just need clarity on which lane everyone's gonna test in and who's gonna pay for it, and then you'll find testing. One more thing on these poor working poor, it's not, they're working poor. Their, their decision is, I'm sick, I think I have COVID, and if I tell someone, I'm gonna lose my job. I'm gonna lose my livelihood. I'm not telling anyone. That, that currently is where we are now. And when you talk to company after company, there is a disincentive right now. Actually, while we've been here, I just got another text from someone saying, hey, I don't want anyone to know this, but I've got some positives. This is the environment we've created because we haven't had clarity on the back end on the question that that listener just asked. And unless we figure that out, um, you know what, we'll all wear our masks and just hunker down. And, call Jim and say, hey, how can I come volunteer? Can I come squeeze an Ambu bag or something? I don't know. <laughs> yes is the answer. <laughs> so with, with COVID impacting lower income populations in higher numbers, um, is there any data um, about any positive impact that our, our new Medicaid expansion, which uh, just started in January, um, maybe has provided in terms of um, access to care. And, and we know that those, um, the numbers of those enrolling in Medicaid um, in, this, in the expansion population as well are on the climb uh, due to some of the unemployment and that sort of thing. So would someone like to comment on the impact of Medicaid expansion during the pandemic? Well, this is, this is Chris. I can start. And, you know, I, I don't work in Medicaid, but I've certainly heard the director mention that, uh, you know, that uh, they think that Medicaid expansion is, is helping. Um, as we've already talked about, it's not the answer. It's not the total answer for every 
buddy. Not everybody is on Medicaid in the state, but uh, for those that are, uh, we know Medicaid does pay for testing. And so we know that will hopefully uh, reduce somewhat the disincentive for testing and uh, will hopefully allow people to get tested and then hopefully also, of course, pay for treatment. So I can't give a complete answer to that, but I do, but I do believe it's helping. Great. Anyone else got a comment? I'd maybe just add the comment. Dr. Nemerson talked about some of the late presentations that we've been seeing as healthcare delivery systems. Um, to the degree that fear about, you know, debt and not being able to pay for your care also exacerbates that delay in addition to what I think uh, Steve and I both would say is now inappropriate fear of our healthcare systems. That, that was pervasive for a while, and I think it's actually still palpable and real. But I, I would say that our, our facilities are some of the safest places to be. The, the dangerous places to be are the downtown bars. <laughs> um, but to the degree that uh, that creates an impediment, um, uh, you know, better access to, um, better front door access to healthcare through Medicaid expansion um, is a positive, and I would expect fewer of those tragic late presentations. All right, so we, we have had a couple of questions come in from uh, attendees today about guidance for schools, um, as some of them are considering reopening in the fall, um, some with sort of hybrid plans or, or leaning towards online. Um, I'll open it for any guidance you have. And, and one question was posed about whether students should be required to wear masks if they do in-person schooling in the fall. Well, this is Chris, I'll start again. Um, I know the governor just announced today a reopening uh, working group that's going to just focus working with um, the, um, of course, the Department of Education um, and school, local school districts, local public health, etc., to really come up with those recommendations across the state. They have been working on it already. We've heard regular updates from Sherry Ibarra on the governor's working group about that. Uh, we are also assisting uh, at the state level with some of our, um, like our Idaho School for the Deaf and Blind. We had a call with them yesterday talking about how they can safely reopen. Um, so it's, uh, it's particulars as far as having students wear face coverings, having teachers wear face coverings or face masks that are, those are gonna be worked out, I think, um, as we go forward. Because there's, um, as Dr. Alk was pointing out, there's, to me, there's really no downside to it for the most part except for sometimes there is. Uh, we talked about with the deaf children at, at the school, for example, they need to have uh, faces uncovered to be able to learn how to speak uh, sign language, so forth. So, so there's, it's always nuanced, and um, we think that this is gonna, as this committee moves forward, we're hoping that they'll come up with some good recommendations. Hey, hey Corey, I'll just add one quick thing. I was, I've been on a couple calls. There's an insatiable appetite in America for every school district, and we have like 114 of them, to all do their own thing. They just, they want to have their own committee, their own plan, their own, they're going to treat COVID different. So one thing that will be really helpful is standardized policies because it's the same thing that everyone's facing. I mean, there's some nuances with rural or whatever, but, but I sat on a call for an hour talking about resource recess protocols. And after a while, I'm like, hey, listen, recess is important, but what are you going to do the first time someone gets influenza and has a fever or strep throat and has a fever or, all the other illnesses that we know are gonna be in October and you have to test people in a first grade class at your school. I would spend a little bit of time on resource pro recess protocols and masks and I'd spend a lot of time saying how on earth are we gonna decipher all the other infectious diseases that come October in a first grade classroom. Um, we need to do both and I, I've not heard anyone talking about that. All I've heard people talk about is how are we gonna keep people safe, not what's gonna happen when we have a flare up in a first grade classroom and uh, we need to do both. I'm going to do a couple of just rapid fire questions and then we're going to go into our last question as we have about five minutes left. Uh, first rapid fire question is, can you catch COVID a second time? Or do the we short answer is we don't know. Um, we uh, are hopeful that the answer is no, but there aren't any good studies out there yet. 
I'll okay. say it. I'm a, I'm a doctor. The answer is no. Almost every viral illness, if you get it, you get an antibody. And the answer is it protects you in the future. Almost everyone we know. We don't know for sure. We won't for three years. But almost every other viral illness, if you get it, you get protection. There's no reason to assume that, it, that you get it twice until some study, three years, some random double blind study says you can. But I don't like the mismessaging sometimes we throw out there. Most viruses, when you get it, you get protection. There's no reason to assume that the answer is not yes. Well, thanks, Tommy. I'm a doctor too. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think what's really the most important message is that um, just because you've had it doesn't mean you shouldn't wear a mask and you shouldn't wash your hands and you shouldn't keep away from somebody who has got it because while it's unlikely, we sure as hell don't want you to get it again if you're unlucky or you have the genetics that allow you to get it again. Right, and, and furthermore, I'll add that in coronaviruses, they have shown short, that protection is short term. It does appear that people can get reinfected. So I do not want to make that presumption either. All right, yeah. um, next, our last rapid fire question will be, what's the difference between probable and confirmed cases and which one of them gets reported in the media? <laughs> so confirmed cases are cases that have a positive test result that's been reported through the lab that they have gone through. A probable case is linked to a, a confirmed case with no actual testing done on their own. They both are reported and they both are also given in our social on any site that people are looking for. If they go to the Department of Health and Welfare site, if they go to the Central District Health site, any local state, we are reporting both probable and confirmed cases. All right, thank you. Um, so our final uh, question for you all to um, consider how you might respond to. Uh, while recent polling shows that most Idahoans support the governor's handling of the pandemic, some Idahoans feel quite strongly that the governor has been too slow to reopen Idaho's economy and too rigid about social distancing. What would you say to those critics? If I could start, um, I'd say the governor is a hero that um, by virtue of shelter in place, we've avoided thousands of cases of coronavirus and we've uh, avoided dozens, maybe even hundreds of deaths. And so um, I, I understand the struggle and I'm not a politician, but uh, how, in the end, how much are those saved lives worth? And um, those lives that were saved, we won't know whose they were, but we know they're real. Uh, I agree that uh, the, the governor prevented a, a catastrophe and uh, I'm going to say something that several on this call have heard me tell this little vignette before, but um, I don't think it's widely known and that's a shame. So since there's an audience, I'm going to share it. You know, in the first five days of April of this year, as Blaine County exploded and the fallout landed in Twin Falls, Idaho, in one of our hospitals, we saw an entire intensive care unit transformed in five days. It went from a run-of-the-mill ICU to an ICU that was a respiratory ICU in five days. At total capacity, anesthesia moved up to the doors outside the ICU, intubating patients in the intermediate care unit and airlifting them west. And we were white knuckled for those last three days of that surge, wondering if the governor's shelter in place order that he had put in place one week before that surge began was going to save us, and it did. We shouldn't forget that, and I, I, I'm stunned by how short our human memory uh, appears to be. So maybe, maybe people just didn't know that that happened, but that happened right here in Idaho and we're prepared for it now. The governor gave us time to prepare. Thank you, Governor Little, for stepping up, listening to your public health advisors and doing the right thing. And I thank Dr. Hahn. I know she had a, a, a role in that. All right, we uh, find ourselves at time. And uh, while I'm sure that we can continue for hours with this um, esteemed panel of health experts, I hope that you will all join me in thanking Dr. Tommy Alquist, Brandon Atkins, Dr. Christine Hahn, Dr. Stephen Nemerson, and Dr. James Souza for participating in today's discussion. And thank you all for your support of City Club. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Corey. Bye, all.